she's saying is you have been given authority from above greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world he has given you power over principalities and rulers and things that we cannot see in the spiritual realm hallelujah you know what all i have heard is people glorifying the devil over this month that we're in but you have the power to take it back take what the enemy meant for evil and take it back just like the Israelites when they took everything from the Egyptians and they sanctified it and made it holy. <laughs> oh man, it's getting lit up up here, man. <laughs> Amen. Boy! 
light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Can we take just a moment and reverence the king of kings do you know that the king of the universe is in the room can we take just a minute and reverence the lord in this place god we honor your presence let's not take it for granted but let's honor the presence of the king that's in this house let's make matt welcome this morning amen working now there we go thank god because i'd be tied down and it would be a mess may trip up and have to have a miracle service after we get done so <laughs> pastor appreciation uh, it's an honor to be here today and i said this a couple weeks ago at the end of the service when uh, brother john had me come and i uh, just speak a quick word and pray over the congregation at the end uh, but we've traveled into so many different places and what you have here at Cornerstone Church is truly remarkable. And it's amazing. And I don't want you to take it for granted because the Spirit of the Lord is allowed to move freely in this church. And in a lot of places, you don't have that. And so uh, it's almost like home when I get to come here and, and uh, be a part of it or to preach to as well and know that God is going to move mightily. But... You know, we just, we're so appreciative, uh, Pastor John and Sarah too as well, and 15 years, right, it, you've been here. And uh, yeah, give them a hand clap. And of course, we know we give God all the praise, but someone had to be obedient to the call of the Lord and allow God to move the way he wanted to move. And so I think you said you started out with 30, and now look at how God has expanded this church. And he shared with me too as well that it just continues to grow on a, a yearly basis. And when you step in with God, you always increase, you never decrease. And so I truly believe that God is going to do something special here, and he's got special plans for this church here in Buchanan that's not just going to shake this area, but that's going to shake this region. And I, I remember when, uh, I remember not too long ago, someone actually released a word about West Virginia, and that West Virginia would be the heartbeat of revival. And before it can be the heartbeat of revival, somebody has to be revival. We can pray for revival. I love that. I'm not, I'm not putting that on the side. We can believe for revival, but there's, there's got to be somebody that says, you know what? I, what I've got on the inside of me, people need. And we've got to understand that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And as you step and do what God has called you to do, no matter what that is, I'm telling you, you will be successful all the days of your life. And so that's what we're seeing here in this church because this is a church uh, just that hosts the presence of God. And when you host the presence of God and glorify him and he moves where he wants to move, God's going to do mighty things. You know, uh, the last couple of weeks when I was here, I'll just start where I stopped last time and just re-release -re this word. But God began to speak to me about glory pools that were going uh, to spring up in America and in the nations of the world. And they would be oases in dry places. And what I mean by that, spiritually dry places or spiritually dead places. And I truly believe that this is one of those glory pools. I believe that this church is going to continue to increase. But what's going to happen, and this was what God spoke to me. He said, many people will flock 
just to come and get a taste and a drink of what God is doing. Because I want to tell you today is, yes, there are many people that are sitting sitting dead in religious churches, but I want to tell you this is the greatest hour of the church. People are hungry. Kids are hungry. People are wanting the supernatural. And if the church doesn't give give it to them, they're going to get it somewhere else. But I want to tell you today that this is a place of the supernatural. This is where God can move freely. I believe that you're about to take another step in the level of glory like never before. And that's what God released to me just this week as I began to pray. And I, I kind of I got, got a laugh because we were with John and Sarah Friday. And, uh, you know, maybe I should have texted you, Pastor Chris, and asked you if they knew. But uh, uh, thank God they revealed it to us before we revealed it to them that they had no idea that we were going to come and and preach. And so I'm sitting there and we're trying to have a poker face as they're like, I don't know who's going to have the mic. And and so <laughs> we, 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 were la- we were laughing about it on the way home. But uh, it, it was funny because as I began to uh, meditate on what God wanted me to release today, um, you know, I was like, man, it's pastor appreciation. What do you want me to do? And God says, well, do what I want you to do. And I truly believe today that I, I have a prophetic word for you to release in this church too as well, but then we're going to preach on it. And of course, we, we start in the Bible, we stay in the Bible, because if it's not Bible, then we get ourselves in trouble sometimes. And so, uh, so anyways, but that's what God spoke to me. And, and here, I'll just, I'll just read it because I jotted a little bit of it down real quick. And this is what God said. He said, and this is what I actually seen for this church. He's, and, I, and I wrote it down like this. I see God releasing a greater level of his glory into this church or house. And I actually see many saved, healed, and delivered without anybody touching them or leading them. Because the presence is going to be so thick that people are just going to have to fall on their knees and say, God, I need you. And they're going to accept them as their their Lord and Savior right then and there. And the funny thing is, is you can receive your healing right now. His glory is here. The Bible says where two or more are gathered, he is in the midst. I know that I believe on the laying of hands and all those different things. But you can reach out and receive whatever you want right in your seat right now. I've seen it several times before when we begin to preach and we would preach on healing or whatever it was. What you tend to preach on manifests in a service. And so we've preached on healing several times. And I remember one time there was a woman that uh, she came to our church up in Ohio. And the funny thing was, is it was kind of ordained by God. Because in her church, they were ripping up the carpet. They had to shut down one Sunday. And she was driving by our church. And the Lord said, I want you to go there this Sunday. And so she came in. And the crazy thing was, is she had been in, I don't know how many wrecks, but it was uh, several wrecks, unheard of wrecks. And her back was all messed up. Now, I didn't know any of this at the beginning. And so I began to preach, but then God began to speak to me. And he said, man, I want you to, to start emphasizing healing right now. And, and as I began to preach on healing and that by his stripes, we are healed. I said, Lord, this doesn't make any sense. I know most of the people here, but I didn't know this woman that came in and she's sitting there squirming right and left. And at first I thought she had a devil because <laughs> when the glory starts to manifest in a service, people that have demons start to get uncomfortable. And so at first I'm like, oh God, this woman's manifesting. But what I didn't know is her back was so messed up, she actually almost decided to get up and walk out. And so I began to preach on healing. And after I got done, she said, can I have the mic? And the Lord said, yeah, go ahead and give her the mic, thank God. And uh, she testified and she said, you don't know any of this. But I came here and the Lord told me to come here. And I received my healing today. I listened to the word of God. I put a demand on the word of God. And as I did that, no one laid hands on me. But my back is completely healed. My spine is restored. And I I thought I was going to have to walk out, but I'm totally healed. See, when the glory moves, I want to tell you, you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and so I truly believe that's what's going to take place. And, and I believe there's going to be times and services where God takes over. And then we just have to step back and say, Lord, do whatever you want to do. I've been in services before where God said, it's cute that you're trying to preach now. And then he would shut me up and we just stand there in the glory of God. And I said, God, what the heck are you doing? I'm supposed to be leading this service. He said, no, you're not supposed to be. I'm supposed to be leading this service. <laughs> Glory. 
So if we would just get out of his way, we would be okay, amen? But like I said, it's truly special to be here to, today. I almost said tonight because that's what evangelists do. They preach at night most of the time. But uh, anyways, um, but I want to talk about the glory tonight or today. And before I, I read my first scripture, let me just re, or just let me uh, let me remind you of this. Do you, anyone has ever heard of Smith Wigglesworth? Smith Wigglesworth was a great man of God that came out of England, and he started his ministry as actually a plumber. And in that day, uh, they didn't have child labor laws, and so uh, children would go to work in factories, and they would get their arms hacked off and their fingers hacked off, and they would be maimed. And so they heard about a man named Smith Wigglesworth who would pray for the sick and they would recover. And so they would send all these kids to the plumber's house and he would begin to pray for them and arms would grow back out, his fingers would grow back out and then he would go, he'd be like, all right guys, go back to work now. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's how he started. And this man was illiterate. He, he couldn't read anything, but finally when he got saved, God supernaturally allowed him to read only one book and that was the Bible. Because for a long time, his, uh, his, his wife actually had to read the Bible to him. And so she'll, she'll stand, she would stand up and say, I don't know how Smithy does it. That's what they used to call him. Smithy does it because he, he doesn't know how to read, but God just supernaturally puts it on the inside of him, and he begins to preach, and great things happen. But Smith Wigglesworth uh, told Lester Summerall right before he died, he said, Lester, he said, you will, be, you will see the beginning of the greatest outpouring of the glory of God before you die. But he said, you'll see the beginning. And now Lester Summerall has passed on and went on to, into glory. And so if he saw the beginning how much, how much more do we know today that we are in the greatest hour of the church? We are on the threshold in the doorstep of God pouring out his glory upon all flesh like never before. And I believe that it's about to break loose, not just in America, but in the nations of the world. See, when they released that word with tongues and interpretation, they talked about breaking principalities. And one way that's going going to take place is God is raising up these glory pools, these churches, these people that are glory carriers that will go out into the nation and the nations of the world that have not bowed their knee to Baal, that have not bowed their knee to a tyrannical government system and said, you know what? The only one I'm bowing to is Jesus himself. <laughs> glory to God. And you are a glory carrier. Look at your neighbor and say, I am a glory carrier. And we'll get into that in a minute, but this is me just saying hello for a second. <laughs> and so we've got to understand is that a lot, of, and I said this uh, the last time or a couple of weeks ago too as well, as I said, uh, the real prophets, not the, not the granola prophets, the fruits, flakes, and nuts, but the real ones, the ones that are, that are uh, very credited and have proved themselves, uh, they're all prophesying the same thing, just like I told you, is that we are on the doorstep of the greatest outpouring of the glory of God that we have ever seen. And so who's ready for that today? I believe it'll manifest today if you allow him to. <laughs> I believe it can happen right now. You know, it only takes one breath of God to just change a community. Just one breath. Just someone getting touched and being launched out to do what God has called them to do. But let me, let me get into this today, and I want to go to Haggai chapter 2 and verse 9, and I'll start here. And like I said, I want to start preaching on, uh, on the glory today, but I want to read this prophetic word that is given in the word of God. And again, that's uh, chapter 2 and verse 9, and it says this. It says, the glory of the latter house. <laughs> I love this. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. So I love this because this should get the church excited. Because he said, in the latter days, the glory of the Lord will increase. That it will be, it will be greater. And 
And so if you remember, in the last days, in the prophet Joel said, what? In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And we begin to see that, uh, of course, on the day of Pentecost. And the same Peter that denied Christ three different times, and at one time denied uh, Christ in front of just a couple little girls at a campfire, now, because of the Holy Ghost that came upon him and everyone in the upper room, the Bible says is that a supernatural boldness came upon him and he preached the gospel. And as he preached the gospel, you knew there were more than 3,000 people there, but the Bible says is that 3,000 were saved right then and there. Could you imagine starting your church with 3,000 people? (laughs) But when God begins to breathe upon you, when God begins to put his glory upon you, I want to tell you nothing is impossible. Glory to God. And so it says right there, as I I read it, is that we've got to understand we are living in the greatest hour of the church. God is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. He's not coming back for a mopey church. He's not coming back for a church that complains. He's coming back for a strong church. He's coming back for a church that is going to take land and occupy until he comes back. See, we've got to understand today, the world is saying that this this world is a mess, and it is. But for the church, this is the greatest hour. Do you know this is the greatest hour for the American church? Because now we see membership declining in a lot of denominational churches. But I want to tell you today that the harvest uh, the harvest is full, but the laborers are few. And God is looking for somebody. He's the Bible says his eyes are searching this world to and fro, looking for somebody to show himself strong in them. And so I believe there's some people today that as you as you bow to God and say, God, here I am, send me in and use me, I believe that God is going to use you in a mighty way. See, we've got to understand something today. It's great to have great pastors, but at the same time, pastors will tell you you've got to have a great team. And so I know it's pastor appreciation, but of course I think we should show a little appreciation for everyone that's involved because it's a body. Paul said it's a body. Some will be the eyes, the nose. Some may be the, the, little, the little toe on the foot. But if you don't think that's uh, anything, try to hack it off and see if you feel it. You feel it. And so whether you, you feel like you're the head or you're the little toe, I want to tell you that you're important. Whether you stand up in the pulpit and preach the thousands or you're behind the scene interceding, I want to tell you that person is just as important as the one standing and preaching the word of God. Hallelujah. And so you have a purpose. God reserved you for such a time as this. Think about that. Just like it was on the screen, I believe it was at the beginning. 2022. This is the greatest hour of the church, and he literally reserved you for this time. And every one of you, I'm telling you right now that you have a plan and purpose, and God wants to use you. But let me, let me talk about the glory just for a moment. And before we get to our next scripture, you know, I just want to I want to talk about just a couple words of the glory. And the first one is, and I'm sure a lot of us has heard this, is the Shekinah glory. And I love this because I want to read the, this note that I have here. Because the Shekinah glory literally means the manifestation of God's presence that dwells with you. I love that. The Shekinah glory represents the glory of God that dwells on the inside of you. And if you want a couple biblical examples back in the day, and thank God we are under the new covenant founded on better promises, but if you remember the glory of God, the presence of God dwelt on top of the ark of the covenant between two cherubim or angels. And so they would have to carry it around very carefully. And if they, if they didn't do it right, they would be struck dead. But how many knows today, thank God we're not in that time. But that same glory and that same presence now lives on the inside of each and every one of us. Amen? Glory. And then if you go and you study it, the Bible teaches us is that the only one that could enter into the holies of holies in that time was the high priest. And if he didn't do everything right, he had little bells that was uh, around his garment and he would walk around and they would stand there and listen to make sure he was moving. And if he didn't move for hours and they couldn't hear a sound, they would drag his dead body out of the presence of God because he didn't ceremonially cleanse himself right. But thank God 
God that now Paul says, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Just like Pastor John said, he said the veil has been torn. One of the first things that happened when Jesus died, the veil was torn from top to bottom. Why? Signifying that now his glory would be manifest in you. <laughs> glory to God. And so we've got to understand today is that the first one that I wanted to talk about was the Shekinah and how he dwells. And I, I believe we can get to a point, I know that, that he lives on the inside of us, but I, I know and I've, I've personally experienced that when you begin to walk in churches that host his presence, you can feel his presence before, before you even get on the grounds. The anointing is tangible. And so uh, when you have people that, that pray the glory in, and you have people that carry the glory. I want to tell you, I've been in churches where you can walk in and it's so thick and it's so heavy. People are having church and revival before even revival service starts. I remember back in the day in, 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 old, in old church times, I remember when I was a little kid, we went to this non-denominational church and it was a Pentecostal church, but it was that old school. People would get happy. The, the preacher would jump over the altar. He would run on the back of the pews and you're wondering how in the world is this even possible? And then I, and then I remember preachers would run and run outside and you're sitting there thinking, how long is he going to keep running outside because we got to get done with this sermon? And then the funny thing was that blew my mind. He'd come back and he would, he would, he would have been right in the middle of one, one word and he would pick up and speak that word again. I said, how in the world does he even remember where he left off? And this is me as a kid and people would get happy and hug, uh, you know, stoves that were really hot and not get burnt because the glory was there. And so, but here's the thing. The reason those services were so great was not because of the preacher preaching the message or the praise and worship team. It was because the elders of the church would come in hours beforehand and pray the glory down before you got in the service. <laughs> and I believe we need to get back to that, and you're going to hear about it in just a moment. But before you see a great outpouring of glory, it's always tied to somebody pressing in and praying the glory down. But I remember... And my dad would tell me stories of where people would be driving alongside the road. And as they were driving alongside the road, their car would just supernaturally break down right in front of the church. And they were not even saved, but they would walk into the church looking for help. And they would come out saved instead of worrying about their car. Now here's the cool thing. Because then they would lay hands on the car and God would supernaturally start it back up and there would not be a problem at all. It was like a big angel just smacked their engine and said, you're stopping here right now and you're getting saved, buddy. <laughs> I'm telling you, when you get in the glory, crazy things happen. This is why I understand you test the spirits. I understand that, like I said, there's some weird things going on in some churches today, but I want to tell you that when the glory manifests, some crazy things start to take place. And we've got to be open to allow God to move the way he wants to move. Hallelujah. Let me see if I can continue on. So uh, the, the Shekinah glory is the glory that dwells with us. But then how many has heard of the Kabod glory? Now I love this one. And I want to stop here just for a moment. And, I, and I'll read this here in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 18. Again, that's Exodus chapter 24 and verse 18. And the Kabod, before I read this, is the weighty glory of God. It, it's when his, his presence just comes in so thick. It's, there's such a weight. And it's like the scripture where the priest went in. I'm getting ahead of myself because I jotted this down, but that's okay. We're going to mess up everyone in the back. But, <laughs> but there was such a weight. When they came in, the Bible literally says is that they begin to praise God with music and cymbals and instruments. And their voice was like one sound. They were in one accord with one another. And one way that we get to a greater level in the glory, we've got to make sure the body is in one accord. Yeah, you know what I'm going to get? I'm going to get off here just for a moment because I feel this is that we've got to understand when revival starts to break out, and I've seen it so many times, and you'll see it in a, a lot of your great moves of God, is that then the enemy starts to divide people. 
He starts to move and division begins to take place. And then you've got some people that, here we go, here's, here's some good pastor appreciation, that don't honor the leadership anymore. And they say, you know what, I can do it better than they can. And so now they separate the church and they take it over to first church. And now they are in rebellion, which is what? It's witchcraft. It's Christian witchcraft. And so we've got to understand today, before the glory of God can manifest, there has to be unity. There has to be. On the day of Pentecost, the Bible says what? They were in one accord. Before the glory of God came. Now, think about this just for a moment. Is Jesus didn't have 120 followers. He had thousands. But here's the thing, is that only 120 was willing to wait, was willing to press in. And I wonder how many under the sound of my voice will do whatever it takes to say, Lord, I know you want to use me and I'll wait until you say go. And see, I'm sure there were thousands that left at that time, but 120 said, you know what? I'll stay until I receive this promise. I'll stay until this fire comes. I'll stay until the Holy Spirit endues me with power from up on high. But let me... Let, let me read this real quick in uh, Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter, whatever I said, 24 and verse 18. Don't be like me if you're going to be a preacher. But it, <laughs> Exodus 24 and 18 says this, then Moses disappeared into the cloud. Sorry, I'll read it on here. In, in, in the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I'll stop there because a cloud, if you go and study the glory, a lot of times a cloud represents the glory. And if you remember this, is that God wanted to meet with Moses and the glory was so thick that he didn't have to eat or drink anything. He just spent time with God. In so much that he came down from the mountain radiating in his glory. See, I wonder how many people are willing to stay in their secret place or, stay, or that want to push until God releases his glory upon you. See, I love it because when the glory become, gets on you, it doesn't just transform you. It starts to begin to transform your household. It starts to begin to transform your workplace. <laughs> if you don't like where you work, catch the glory. Because I want to tell you, yeah, people are going to come up against you, but there's revival on the inside of you, and I've seen it so many times. There was a guy, they call him the, 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 the oil field evangelist. He didn't like what was going on, and if you work on the oil field, you understand what I'm talking about. Everyone has filthy mouths and, and dirty jokes and different things like this, and this guy said, enough's enough. There's something on the inside of me these people need to hear, and now I can't remember, but it's thousands of people that this man has saved on the oil field just working. See, you got to understand, ministry is just not in the pulpit. Ministry is out there wherever you go. It's there in Walmart. It's there at your workplace. It's there in the school system. It's there wherever God places you. But see, the problem is, is everyone wants the mic and everyone wants the spotlight. <laughs> and so this is why division starts to happen too as well. Man, if God has gifted me and the pastor's not seeing me right now, how dare he skip over me and not think about me? But I want to tell you today, be careful what your mindset's like. Because God will never use you if you continue to rebel and you continue to push against what God has placed in the pulpit. This is why it's so important that you honor your leadership and your pastors. Why? It's because you're not just honoring them. You are literally honoring God. See, people don't really realize that. When you dishonor pastors, you're not dishonoring pastors. You're dishonoring God himself because God was the one that put them there in the first place. And so then, what? and I've seen it before, when people begin to dishonor instead of honor, what you don't honor, you will never receive from. Let me say that again. What you don't honor, you'll never receive from. And so, here we go again. Thank you, Lord, Pastor Appreciation. We're starting to hit it, hit it hard there. But no, we've got to understand today is that but we've got to have unity before the glory starts to manifest in a greater way. And I'll just go ahead and read this, even though I talked about it in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 13 and 14 real quick. And then, like I said, I've already mentioned this, but 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13 and 14 says this. And it says, And it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one, 
to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanksgiving to the Lord. When they had lifted up their voice with trumpets and cymbals and instruments and music and music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good and his mercy endures forever. Then the house was filled with a cloud. That's the glory. See, do you know that your thermostats in services? And if you're hungry, God will manifest. God will begin to move. And I'm sure anyone that's in ministry understands this, but uh, thank God for churches that are open because I've been to churches where you're preaching to just a bunch of dead people. And God can't really move in those services. I'm like, David, I had to encourage myself in the Lord sometimes because I'm like, oh God, I'm not getting anything from them. So Lord, I'm just going to have to encourage myself. And so I had to learn at an early age in ministry, it wasn't about getting amens. It wasn't about getting a reaction from the crowd. If no one's going to drink, I'm going to drink. I say this all the time, but this is the only job and the only calling that you can drink on the job. (laughs) <laughs> there's been many times I'll walk around and I don't even know I'm half drunk and I'm not half drunk on alcohol. I'm drunk on the Holy Ghost. I'm drunk on the new wine of heaven. <laughs> but it's got to start somewhere. If you want your house to change, you got to start drinking. If we want to see America change, we got to have a bunch of drunks up in Cornerstone getting ready to drink the new wine of heaven and said, I'm not coming down from that high. I'm going to stay there. Glory. I remember one time coming out of a service and I went, to, uh, I, I went to Walmart and I was still all messed up. And I walked in and I, I, was, I was hiring a kite, and not on marijuana or bad weed or anything like that, but on the glory of God. And I said, Lord, I have no idea what happened there, but as I began to minister, I walked in and they probably thought I was half stoned on something. I was on the glory, in the cloud. <laughs> you know, they smoke and a cloud fills, but when we praise, the cloud fills here, Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> so when, but like I was saying is when you, you're a thermostat in this service and how it goes. You know, it's great to have a great praise and worship team and great preachers that can preach the house down. But if we don't have a hungry congregation, then God's not going to manifest the way he wants to manifest. And so we've got to understand if you want to see a greater level of glory come into this house, we've got to have people that get not just hungry, but extra hungry. People that are like in the desert that haven't ate and drank in a long time and said, Lord, you know what? Here I am. It's just like that old hymn, here's my cup. Fill it up, Lord. Not fill it up to the brim, but fill it to overflow. And Lord, let me eat on the bread of heaven till I will. Oh, I don't want any more. Not just enough, but more than enough. And we serve El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. He's more willing to give you something or pour out into you than you are to receive it. <laughs> Glory. And so going back to this, I truly believe that God is releasing the Kabod glory in many different places and many different houses again where it's going to come and it's just going to wreck our services. Because when you, you see what I read here, they were just doing their normal thing in a sense. And if we're not careful, we can get stuck in religious ways. But praise God, they went in and they were as one, one sound as they began to praise God. And the Bible says, as they begin to praise and worship God, then the cloud came. <laughs> and see, there was, there was some times in the worship too as well where the glory was starting to fill in a great way here today. And so one thing we've got to understand is we've got to be very sensitive, just like Caleb was talking about too as well, to when the glory shows up, do what he tells you to do. Amen. Now I'm not trying to tell you to do something crazy first. You've got to get your pastor's permission and different things like that. But we've got to understand how God wants to move, then move. Amen. Move his way. But we got to understand today, and I truly believe this, is that God is releasing the Kabod glory back into the church where he's just going to take over the services. And like I released the word, I truly believe that when this comes, and it's going to happen here, is I truly believe that no one, everyone's going to be beside themselves. The Bible says the priest could not even stand to minister, couldn't even perform their services. They just had to lay there in the glory. Now, I love this because... When um, in January 21st of last year, some of you heard this testimony, and some of you know me because of this testimony, but I was, I was on a 21-day fast at the beginning of the year, and the first Friday of January, I lost my job. And I said, Lord, 
you know what, I'm fasting. This is not how it's supposed to go. Now, now I'm worried about how we're going to provide for our family at that time. And I remember as, um, as I lost my job, God said, I want you to spend as much time as you did at work with me. And so every morning I would, I would get up and I would spend two or three hours in the morning and then at lunchtime and when Z would go down for, for his nap, I would spend a couple more hours with God and then at nighttime I would do the same thing. And so I was spending six to eight hours just with the Lord. Now, how many knows that there are times that, <laughs> there were times when in that time that I'm just walking around and saying, man, nothing's happening. I'm praying to you, Lord. I'm pouring out, but it just doesn't feel like anything's really moving. But how many knows that you got to continue to press? Because it's not about your feelings, it's about faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And so if I would have stopped in the middle of that fast and said, you know, this is useless, not, nothing's going on, I would have missed one of the greatest encounters that I've ever experienced in my life. And so on January 21st, go figure, the last day of my fast, I'm standing up here just kind of like standing up at the church I was at, just praying. And as I was praying, walking to, back and forth, um, all of a sudden I heard the door open in the church, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I'm here spending time with the Lord, and now someone's going to come and interrupt this thing. You know, this is, this is not how it's supposed to go. And it was actually getting good at that moment. And so then <laughs> I'm standing there waiting for someone to come in, no one comes in. And so I said, huh, that's weird. And so then I began to pray again. And I felt God tell me, I want you to bend down on the front pew. And I want you to begin to press in. And as I began to press in, all of a sudden I heard, I heard footsteps in, in the other room. And I said, so someone was here. And that's what I was thinking. Now they probably think I look, I look like an idiot to them because they're probably seeing me worship you know, behind closed doors too as well. And sometimes worship can get messy when you're all alone. And I'm like, now they're going to see me looking like an idiot. But then all of a sudden, I remember as I'm down on my knees, there was such a glory that came into the room that I began to weep uncontrollably. uncontrollably. It wasn't one of those nice, pretty cries. It was one of those really bad cries that you just look like a mess. And I said, what in the world is going on? And I heard the Lord say, lift up your head. And so I lifted up my head, and Jesus himself was standing at the back of the church. Our Lord and Savior was standing there. The one that died on the cross for me was standing there. And as he began to get closer to me, the glory began to increase in so much that I told him, I said, Jesus, you're going to have to take some of this off of me because I'm going to explode from the inside out if you don't. And so Jesus kind of looked up at me and he, he smiled because he says, yeah, this usually happens when I walk into a room. <laughs> and so... And so he, of course, he took some of it off me because now I really understand why we got to have glorified bodies when we go to heaven because you would not be able to handle the presence of God in heaven. And so he took a little bit off, but the only thing I could do, I'm on my face weeping and he comes and he stands before me and I reach out and I touch his feet. And as I'm touching his feet, the only thing I can think of is I'm literally touching the son of God. I'm, I'm literally touching the Messiah. I'm literally touching Jesus himself. And so I picked up my head and he picked me up. And as he picked me up, he, he embraced me and Three things I noticed when Jesus came into a room. Number one, the love that he has for us is something that I cannot describe. It's greater than a mother and father's love. It's greater than a husband or a wife's love. And there was such a love that came into the room that I have never experienced before. And then a peace came up on me. The Bible says he'll give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. And I remember this peace that came up on me. Everything that I was worried about... Our finances melted away. The, uh, worried about a job melted away. And I knew in that moment that Jesus was going to take care of everything. Oh, and then the power. And like I've already told you before, the power that was in that room that day. How I wish I could describe it. But I want to tell you that God wants to release that power everywhere if people are hungry enough. And so he picked me up and... He's, we sat down for a moment, and I was like Paul for a second. 
because I didn't know if I was in my body or out of my body at this time, and he took me up into the throne room of God just like Pastor John talked about. And I'm laying there. And as I'm laying there, I know that I'm in the throne room. I'm, I'm in the same room that Isaiah prophesied about and talked about how God picked him up and he saw the Lord sitting on his throne. As angels were circling around about crying, holy, holy, holy. And I knew I was, I was laying there in front of God, but I did not dare pick up my head. And the only thing I remember is that I was in this, this bright room and there was such a mist that was all over the throne room and I knew it to be the glory of God. And see, the Bible teaches us and Jesus told his disciples, he said, when you pray, if you remember, you know, the Lord's prayer, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, there is so much glory in heaven. Everything is covered in his glory. But Jesus said, what's in heaven I want to release on this earth. And it's biblical to pray that and see his glory manifest. And so I'm laying there just continually weeping under the power of God. And then he picked me up and we sat on this rock and we were overlooking uh, probably the Sea of Galilee. I don't know where it was, but we're sitting there. And here's the crazy thing is he was talking to me just like I was a normal person. Like I'm sitting here with you and we begin to talk and he said, Matt, I want you to do two things for me. I said, okay, Lord, what's that? He said, number one, tell my people that I love them. Oh, the love that he has, not just for people that are in the church, but the love that he has for every sinner, everyone that serves a different God. He said, I, I really don't care what they're into. I just want them to come to me. I want them to walk through me so that they can make it to heaven. Oh, man, there's a shift in this room right now if you can grab a hold of it. And... He said, Matt, tell them that I'm coming back very soon. And so we're sitting there, and here's the funny thing that I learned about Jesus. He was more eager to be with me than I was with him. He was yearning for my time. He loved me so much that he came to visit me. Now, I don't know why he came to visit me in that moment, and People, I remember when I told people about this, I started to get ridiculed and people say, how dare you say that Jesus come to visit you? If he was going to visit anyone first, it would have been me. And I remember most of the hate that I got when I, when I told that story on Facebook and it reached over 1.4 million views just on Facebook alone is that it was from the church, it wasn't from sinners. And they were so angry that Jesus came and just paid me a visit. And some of them were angry, and it wasn't a church day, but I was, a, I was wearing a hat when I did that video, and some of them were so religious, they said, God can't use you, you're wearing a hat, and you're sitting in church. <laughs> See, we got to understand that there's some people that are in the church that's constipated with religion. <laughs> I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going to say it anyways. And so what we need is we need a Holy Ghost suppository to be shoved up them to blow up the religious crap and blow it out. <laughs> because it's not about religion, it's about relationship. Church is not going to get you to heaven, but a relationship with Jesus is what's going to get you there. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And if you're not saved today, I want to tell you, I haven't come to preach a religious message. I've come to allow you to taste that Jesus is good and he wants to be a part of your life. I've gotten way off my notes, but that's okay. Sorry, sorry guys in the back, <laughs> but we just got to flow with the Holy Ghost. And so I remember when I did that video, I said, I'm not going to do it, Lord. He said, you're going to do it. I said, I'm not going to do it. He said, you're going to do it. And I said, okay, I guess I'm going to do it. I said, people are going to think I'm nuts. And sure enough, they did. But I remember when I did it, it was a 12-minute video, and I put it on there, and I said, well, if we can just get a couple people saved off this video, it'll be great. That's all I'm looking for. Maybe a thousand people's going to watch this thing. A couple people get saved. That'll be worth it all. And then all of a sudden, after a week, it climbed to a uh, hundred thousand views. And then the next week, 
200,000 and kept going and going and going and going. And I said, my God, what's going on? And if I be honest with you, it was probably one of the, the worst videos that you've seen because I said the same three things over again. Jesus loves you. He hates religion. Come to him. And that's basically all I said. And so then I remember I said, God, why are you using this video the way you are? He said, it's because, Matt, it's not because of you, but what you just came out of. See, what, what, you, what you catch in the secret place manifests in the natural let me say that again. What you catch in the secret place will begin to manifest in the natural realm. And so I didn't know that, the, 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 that that's what happened. And people would tell me, and they would tell me all the time, that, or people would message me and say, hey, I just got saved um, off your video. We had one woman from New York saying, you don't know me. I watched your video. It came out from, you know, I don't know how I got to see it, but I got to see it. And then all of a sudden, I sent it to my, I sent it to my aunt, and as I sent it to my aunt, uh, she has never been in church before and she doesn't believe in Jesus, but she watched your video and she's here on Sunday morning giving her life to the Lord. We had people that were sitting, that were sitting in, in, at their jobs on, on their computers watching this and as they're watching this, they're falling out under the power of God, had never experienced that before in their life and instead of church, God is moving at their job site. And people are probably looking at them like they're nuts. And so, I want to tell you is that out of encounter comes impact. When you stay in the glory, impact will come. See, that's just like, I talked about this a little bit last night when I preached, but it's like the five wise, they had extra oil. And see, in today's world, we need, to, we need to carry extra oil and stay in the secret place. Stay in the holies of holies. The veil has been torn. You can enter into the holies of holies on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You don't have to wait to come to Cornerstone on Sunday to get something. You can get something every day of the week. I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Jesus said, I am the manna from heaven. And if you remember, they dropped manna from heaven every day. And God's got something except for one day, but God's got something for you every day. He said, let me be your bread. Let me be that manna. Let me drop something for you. And, I, and if you think about it this way, God's got something new every day and you don't need to miss it. And so real quick, we've got to understand that I believe that God is, is moving in a tremendous way and that he wants to mess, manifest his glory in this service, in this place. And then before we get there, I want to talk about one more thing and I'll finish up, I promise. Is that not just unity needs to take place, not, not just hunger and thirst, but purity needs to come back to the body of Christ. Because don't you understand that you can offend the Holy Ghost? I love what one man preached one time. He said, I know that the Holy Spirit is not a dove. But he said, I want to use a dove as a symbol just for a moment. He said, imagine this. If you had a dove on your shoulder when you woke up and you did not want to scare it off, you would walk differently. You would get up out of bed differently. And when a dove is on your shoulder, you will start to talk a little quieter because if you get too loud, it will fly off and you will scare him. And so he said it's the same way with the Holy Spirit. When you sit down and watch something, is that something that will offend the Holy Ghost? With the words out of your mouth, is, is it grieving the Spirit of God or is he liking what you're saying? And so just imagine having that dove on your shoulder every day that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. He dwells in you. <laughs> and when you walk, he walks with you. And I'll just say this too as well, not just for a personal walk, but I wonder how many places in churches where the Holy Spirit is so grieved because he's not allowed to do what he wants to do. I always use this analogy, but it's like if I was throwing a birthday party for John and I invited everyone in, but when John showed up, I locked the door. And we had a party without him. That's what's happening in a lot of our churches is that 
oh yeah, we want to have a great service, but man, that preacher better not preach more than 20 minutes. And if that's the case, I'm in trouble. The singers better sing uh, uh, about three hymns and hers and the preacher preach for 15 and 20 minutes because we've got to get to the restaurant or the buffet before the Methodists and the Baptists and all the other ones too as well before they eat all their food. You don't have to worry about the Pentecostals though because they're rolling around on the floor for about three more hours before they're going to make it. <laughs> they're eating on natural food while we eat on spiritual food. Amen. <laughs> and I think it tastes better. And so we've got to have purity that comes back. And God told me this. He said, before the greatest outpouring comes, and I'm not just talking about this church, but in the world, he said, the fear of the Lord is going to come back. Because how many, how many know that we've got pastors in the pulpits that don't even care what's going on or doesn't even fear the Lord anymore, is just doing whatever they want to do? I heard an interview of a pastor in California, go figure, but anyways, he was up there and they asked him, they said, uh, do you believe in this Jesus that you preached about? And he looked at him and said, no. And he said, then why are you preaching? He said, are you kidding me? It's the greatest job in the world. I just show up on Sunday, preach a 20-minute message. They give me a house. They give me a salary. So I just, I just fake it till I make it. I just preach a, a message. Now you can go on, on uh, any website and go to poorpastors.com uh, and print you out a sermon. It's already done, already got the bullet points. And instead of being led by the Holy Ghost, now you've got the Internet preaching for you. And so the Lord says the fear of the Lord is coming back and you will see a holiness and you will see a purity move take place once again before the greatest outpouring takes place. And if you remember this already happened before, but God says it's going to be in a, a mightier way. I promise I'm almost done. And so purity has to come back before the, the, the presence of God moves in a mighty way. Here's where I finish up. Can I just tell you a couple stories of what happened in the past to look at what, wants, what God wants to do in the future? I talked about this the last time I was here preaching, and I came out of this, but John Wesley in the Methodist move was a Holy Ghost move. Now, in today's world, uh, the, the Methodist church is called the Frozen Chosen. Now, I can say that because I came out of that denomination. Actually, my dad and my grandpa are still in it, but they're not Methodist preachers. They just do what God tells them to do. And praise God, God's moving on their behalf. There are still good denominational churches out there. I get that, but there are many that are still dead. And so John Wesley came over the first time in America, and he failed miserably. No one would listen to him, didn't get anybody saved. He got back on the boat, and he met a couple Moravians. And they started ministering to him just like John or just like Paul did to John the disciples or John the disciples uh, or John who <laughs> John's disciples. My goodness, tongue tie there. And they said the same thing to John Wesley that Paul said to uh, John's disciples. He said, "Have you heard of the Holy Ghost?" And John Wesley said, "Not really." Have you heard of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? No, don't even know what that is. He came from a very dead denomination at that time in his own country. And he said, if you're going to be successful in your ministry, you need the Holy Ghost. And so if you go and you study his journals, when it got to this point in his life, he said they laid hands on him and a warm, funny feeling came over him and he went back to his own nation and preached about the Holy Ghost. And you know what happened to him? They threw him out of every church that he went to. It got so bad that he said, you know what? I'm so angry that if they're going to throw me out of church, I'm going to stand in the cemetery right now and I'm going to finish my sermon and make them listen to me whether they like it or not. <laughs> and so, see, that didn't bode well for the church or the people in the church, but I truly believe God was looking at John that day and saying, that's my man. Because how many knows that when you start to be used by God, it's not pretty sometimes. Sometimes you have people that stab you in your back. People that are for you come against you. I, and I, I'm not trying to make people depressed or anything like that. But I found out in ministry, ministry can be a lonely road sometimes. Because the ones that you put all your trust in and you loved on all of a sudden turns their back on you and they leave you. Many people come and they use you for what you got and when they get it, then they leave. 
And so, so after I got everyone depressed, let's get back on the good stuff just for a moment. <laughs> and so John, I, John Wesley, God spoke to him and said, now go back to America because you've got what you needed. And he went back to America, and as he did, the stories go that he would stand on, on tree stumps and begin to preach the word of God, and thousands would fill the field around him. In so much they would climb trees just to get a glimpse of John Wesley, and he would actually have to tell them, get out of the tree, because if the Holy Ghost hits you, we don't want you to fall out. And so the first time it happened, people were, were falling out under the presence of God. He had no idea what it was. And so they looked at John and said, John, is that God? And he said, well, I don't really know, but when she wakes up, we'll find out. And so, and so the woman waked up the first time that it happened, and guess what happened? She woke up praising and shouting unto God, and he said, well, it must have been God. Hallelujah. This must be a normal thing now. And so this move swept throughout America in so much that John was one of these circuit riders. He'd get on his horse and ride from town to town and city to city preaching the gospel. And his horse would die on the middle of the road. And you know what John did? He would lay his hands on his horse, tell it to get back up because we got another city to preach in. And I've come to tell somebody today, it's time to pick yourself up. Get out of the dust. I know you've been hurt. I know that you've been stabbed in the back but God says I've got greater you went through what you went through you you passed the test now get ready because greater is coming in your life hallelujah and so we had John and then uh, if you remember a lot of people remember this one but uh, the Azusa Street Revival it was red hot for three years do you know how it started? It started because people were praying. It was, it was, of course, William Seymour, and it was only a group of seven others that came into this dump of a building. And they would pray for a move of God. And the story goes is that one day as they were pushing, do you know what push stands for? Pray until something happens. And so they were pushing. And as they were pushing, he said it was like electricity or a lightning bolt hit the prayer meeting, and everyone got hit with the Holy Ghost, and it started with eight people, and after eight people got hit and touched by the power of God, it grew so much that people came from other nations to see what was taking place and get in the glory. It was so good of a move that and just instantaneously, ears would grow back that people had lost. Like I talked about before with Smith Wigglesworth, arms would start growing back and no one would be laying hands. It was just the glory of God. And the manifestation of the glory was so thick that actually on the dump of the building, there was a fire that came on the roof. And it wasn't a normal fire. People called 911 and the fire department said, hey, that burning is building. When they ran in, there was no smoke on the inside and when they came out they still seen the flames on top of the roof and I'm coming to tell you today that we're about to see manifestations like that again in the church in the mighty name of Jesus Christ <laughs> and it said when they would gather outside because the building became too small for the revival they went outside and the fire would dance around them People thought they were nuts, but it was the glory manifesting in such a way that people could see it in the natural realm. Hallelujah. Then uh, you remember this one. I love this one, Charles Finney and Brother Daniel Nash. Charles Finney, if you don't know who it was, was a great man of God at this time. This is where I finish up. And Charles Finney, everywhere he went, he had such supernatural things take place that entire cities would get saved. Everybody. But do you know how it started? Charles Finney was traveling, and he ran into a man named Brother Nash. And Nash had his own ministry, but he felt to come alongside Charles. But he came to be an intercessor. And Charles would send him weeks in advance to a city and he would pray and he would pray so loud 
that people on the streets would hear, hear this man in the hotel thinking he was dying. And all he was doing was crying out unto God to move in the city in so much that people would be going shopping on the street and fall down weeping in the presence of God even before Charles Finney got there to preach and people were getting saved. There's coming a time where God is, is linking back intercessors and preachers again. And I love one prophecy is this, is you're not going to know where one ministry starts and one ministry stops because God is bringing unity not just into churches. He's bringing unity back to the body of Christ where it's not going to be about who's got the mic. It's not going to be about who's being used. It's going to be, I'm coming to see you, Jesus. I'm I'm coming to have an encounter with you. Who came to Cornerstone today wanting to have an encounter with Jesus? Amen. Who came today not to listen to a sermon, not to listen to praise and worship, but say, Lord, here I am, and I need you. Pour into me and fill me to the overflow. Glory to God. And so then Charles Finney would come after he would pray for weeks. And the atmosphere would begin to be filled so thick with the glory that in New York, they could not uh, get their boats in because everyone 15 miles out in the sea were falling out under the power of God. There was no driver anymore. They were all weeping under the power of God in the presence of God. And then it was funny because everywhere he went, people would go out and drink in the pubs, but when Charles Finney showed up, they would order a beer, and they would sit there with their mug, and they would try to pick it up and bring it to their mouth, but the mug would not even move off the countertop, and so I, they said this. They said, well, I guess if we can't have a good time in the pub, we might as well go to the church because I hear there's some drunks there too as well, and entire cities got saved to the point that that all the places that were full of sin was shut down because someone knew to push and wait until God moved and the atmosphere filled so thick that even miles away from cities, God would start to arrest people. I remember the last thing I'm going to say is this. I remember God called me to help out in a crusade in Dominica and I was telling Brother John this Friday night too as well. But we were there and as we were there, we found out that the government and the president of that nation was pushing communism and socialism into the country and being paid for it. And so when he found out that we were going to preach the gospel, everyone came down on us. We had to meet with the, the, the chief whatever officer, medical officer, surgeon, whatever you call him in that, in that area, we had to meet with the mayor, and we, had, and we didn't meet the president, but we met with all his higher-ups, and they told us not to preach the gospel. And they used, at that time, COVID did not hit, but it was coming, and they used that to try to silence our voice. And so we're standing there, and we've, we're already there. We're basically got everything done, and we said, Lord, what are we going to do? And God said, I want you to squeak out an altar call. And as you squeak out an altar call, um, I'm going to move. And when we begin to preach the gospel, the private police, the president's own police and security came to arrest us. But I want to tell you, as we stood and we did what God had called us to do, the glory arrested every police officer that, officer that showed up. And you know what they did? They turned around, got back in their car, and they left. And so <laughs> I've come to tell you today that, that God is going to move in a mighty, mighty, mighty way. And get ready for it here in Cornerstone too as well. There's such an expectation. There's such, there, there's such a hunger in this place, but God is saying, can you push a little more? Hallelujah. And so this is what I want to do just for a moment. If you would, could you stand up for me real quick? The glory is here. He is here today. And I love what this, this church does too as well is because, and I remember when I first got started in this is that 
you know, the altar's always open. And, and I love that. Yeah, I probably should have called the, the, or the music team to come up to as well. And I want to tell you, his glory is here. And his glory is here for anything that you would need. I love what the woman with the issue of blood did. She went to Jesus. Jesus didn't go to her. And the Bible says, is out of desperation, she pushed through the crowd. There's something to be said when you come desperate before the Lord. I'm not talking about you being broken. I'm just talking about I'm so desperate that I need a touch. And if you study that scripture, this woman was deemed unclean. And if she would have touched anybody, she signed her death warrant. They had every right to stone her to death. And not only did she touch Jesus, she touched everyone in the crowd to get to him. And so, have you come with a desperation today? She said, if I can just touch him, I know that I'll be made whole. And I love what Jesus did. What did he do? He turned around to her, and as he turned around to her, he said, daughter, your faith. It wasn't me. Your faith pulled that virtue, pulled that power out of me. Have you come with a faith today knowing that God can touch you? Because I believe that for the ones that are going to come to the altar today, I, I believe that there, there's a, a greater mantle being released on some. I believe that for some of you, healing is already in this room. It's already here. If you need deliverance, it's already here. But will you come with a desperation? Will you come knowing if I can just touch Jesus, if I can just see his face, if I can just get him to move on me, I know everything will be all right. So this is what I want to do. Can I have every head bowed and every eyes closed as we finish up? If you're here today and you need a miracle, if you're here today and you need a healing, God is still Jehovah Rapha. If you're here today and you just need a touch, If you're here today and you've been oppressed, maybe it's, maybe it's suicide, maybe it's anxiety, maybe it's depression. Maybe you're here today and I want to tell you, diabetes still has to bow out in the name of Jesus. Cancer still dies at the name of Jesus. For you ones that are in a deep depression that you, you don't think you can come out of it, I want to tell you today, in his presence there is fullness of joy. Where his spirit is, there is liberty. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, then know Jesus today. He's here and he wants to meet you. And I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship. So if you're here with every head bowed and every eyes closed and if you're here and you say, Matt, I need something from God. I want to come up today and I want to, and I'm coming up desperate and I know God's going to move. Will you wave your hand right now and say, Matt, that's me. I'm coming up. Let's see all those hands that are coming up right now. Look at all those hands. I want to tell you, even, even if you don't need a physical touch, even if you don't need a, a deliverance or whatever that is or salvation, you can still come today and come with an expectation and God will pour out into you. As, you, as they play right now and sing, will you come? Every, every one of you that raised your hand, come and fill this altar. His glory is here today. His glory wants to manifest on you and in you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Come as they play. Father, we thank you. <laughs> we praise you as they cry out and they push. Your glory is here. You see them hungry, Father. Let them experience. And if, of course, we have our altar team that wants to come and pray, come and pray too as well with them. But God is here right now. God is moving right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Depression is leaving in this moment. He says the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
abuse that you've experienced, God is allowing that to melt away now in Jesus' mighty name. Those words that have been spoken against you, that's cut you deep, God is saying, I'm picking up the broken pieces right now. <laughs> Let me love on you like no one has. I see arthritis right now leaving people's body in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I see spines being straightened right now in Jesus' mighty name. I see knees being replaced as you've come to the altar in Jesus' mighty name. Glory to God. Fill your people. Fill your people. <laughs> Hallelujah. I see mantles being released, and I hear the Lord saying to some of you right now that you may not think that you can be used, but God is going to use you. Some of the things that you're coming out of right now, some of the things that you've been delivered from, I'm telling you right now, God's anointed you to set the captive free in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we love you. Father, we thank you. Hear the cries of your people. <laughs> Hear the cries of your people. See their hunger. You promised, Lord, that if we're hungry and thirsty, that you would fill us today in Jesus' name. Fill your people. Fill your people. The glory is here. <laughs> the glory is here. His peace is here. His joy is here. Whatever you need, he's here. He said that I am. I am whatever you need. <laughs> I see God coming close to the brokenhearted ones that have experienced death lately. God is about to, to pick you up out of that pit. And as you have been sad, God is going to release an oil of gladness on you today. This is revival. Hear the cries of your people. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you. You said when we believe, when we pray, believe that we've received. And we will have. And Father, they've come. Glory. 